Welcome back, Zerke fans, to more of the December 21v1 tournament. Iron Man, your host, Shadow Fury 333, and we have well, round two. We are on to Google Frog versus Orphelius as the first match for round two, and that is going to be on Intersection, because that's what the map pool has. That's actually a pretty good map. I haven't seen this new version of it. Probably just an aesthetic upgrade, but at the same time, Intersection has gone through a lot of changes from a gameplay perspective, so it'll be interesting to see how this new map plays out Especially compared to the old one, because the old one... The old one was good. Oh, darn it. The old one was good. I mean, I'm not going to lie. That was a solid map. Though it was obviously one of those maps that could be a little bit annoying to some players. But I don't know how this is going to work in terms of this tournament. Because we, like I said, have not seen it all that often. I mean, looking at the map image, it looks like not a whole lot has changed overall. So very likely it is purely an aesthetic upgrade. In terms of metal placement, everything looks exactly the same as it was before. Just prettier. But at this point, I am... Hmm, I'm kind of curious what is going to be... What is going to be the st strategy for both players this time around? I'm pretty sure we are going to see a very vehicle-focused match. This map has a tendency to get a lot of rovers, or potentially tanks. Has a tendency to... You just get a lot of buildup overall. Like it's it's a map that you can build up for both sides and kind of last for a while, or just have both corners and take the map inside five minutes. It really varies. But at any rate, we are going to be moving into that, and that is going to be quite exciting moving forward. So, like I said, I'm just trying to think, what would they go for? I mean, this map, you usually see either Cloak or Life Vehicle, or Rover, rather. That's usually how it works. It's usually not something too complex. Cloaky or Rover. Both are good, because both are able to handle the the ground shifts. Both are able to handle the... Well, the fact that it's a fairly large map, fairly open map. So, I expect to see quite a bit of that. And also, it's slightly nicer looking. I mean, to normals. Not entirely sure where the changes came in because it's still. I guess it's not changed the way I expected it to be because I expect. I guess I expected more shininess off of the concrete. But, I mean, it, it's a bit bluer. We, I mean, have a bluer sky. I'm not quite sure what was changed. Sorry, I. It doesn't look that different to me. It just looks a touch more detail with the bump maps in the bottom. But I digress. Google Frog going for the Clokebot Factory, as is Orphelius. Both players going for that flexible bastion of two-legged goodness. As both players also go for an early glaive, because, as always, glaive is a pretty strong choice early on. That's how you get in. That's how you get the damage done. That's how you manage to get a little bit of scouting done as well. Though Orphelius putting far less into the... Oh, no, never mind. They're putting as much into their starting glaives. The difference being that they are keeping them together, which could be a slight advantage. Google Frog, however... Going around the side, which will allow Google Frog to get the scouting in more reliably, as Orphelius doesn't have anything over on their eastern side. But at the same time, they might lose their glaive. Actually, they won't lose their glaive. In fact, Google Frog is in a really good spot to defend against this, whereas Orphelius, they have very quick conjure coming out here, but nothing to really defend it. They have one glaive, which is going forward, which is dealing with that one front glaive that came in that got some damage, but that's fine. Because at this point, the real story is that this one conjurer will not be able to build anything before it goes down. Google Frog getting loads of value off of that one glaive. The second glaive is not coming in, but it doesn't really matter. The second glaive can just sort of hang out. And indeed, that's exactly what it's doing over to the eastern side of the map. Just getting a position to work with. And already getting rid of one of Orphelius' glaives. So getting rid of a glaive and a conjurer for the cost of a glaive. Really, the conjurer on its own is value. Google Frog is way ahead at this point. And a second little harasser coming in the back. But really the story is the front glaze coming here. These four glaze could deal significant amounts of damage. If they manage to get through the Lotus, there's nothing else stopping them. And Orphelius, I mean, they have their own glaze, which Google Frog seems to realize at this point. But it doesn't matter for Google Frog. They got their advantage. They killed the worker. They slowed down Orphelius' expansion. Or just Orphelius' is filling out of their main base. Not even expansion, just getting in the top plateau. But Google Frog able to expand far more efficiently as a result of that, and getting a slight economic advantage to boot. On top of the fact that they've managed to de deal more damage, metal-wise. 
So with that, Google Frog is in a very strong position, keeping Orphelius essentially contained, as Orphelius can't easily send out any workers to the corners, since they would die to Glaives. However, if Google Frog's not careful, they could lose their Glaive army here, and that would open up Orphelius, allowing them to get that expansion over to the northeast and southwest. If that happened, we would have an even game. If that doesn't happen, Google Frog's going to maintain the advantage, but I see Orphelius is about to break out here. Six, seven Glaives coming in over the eastern side that will stop this entire blockade from the east. The southern blockade will still go strong, but as long as one corner is available for Orphelius, they are fine. They're going to be able to expand, they're going to be able to set themselves up and get additional funding. And at this point, the economy is about even. Really, it's just a question of what happens when the first expansions happen. And the southern blockade has also been broken. So Google Frog has no way of easily stopping Orphelius from expanding in either direction. And at this point, Orphelius is, in fact, planning to expand to the south, which I'm not sure why. I mean, when you consider the fact that Orphelius has much greater control over the eastern side of the map than the southern side of the map, I question why the southern side has been picked for Orphelius. Or this. No, never mind. Those questions are also Orphelius' questions, as Orphelius decides to go over to the eastern side of the map instead of the southern side of the map. And that is a really good choice on their part, because they kind of have to, although I really hope they're not watching the stream. I mean, I'm fairly certain there's a delay on it. I honestly haven't checked. It, I'm not quite sure if OBS starts the delay if you set the delay option without restarting the stream. So, if it looks snipable, I mean, it's probably possibly snipable. I hope not, though. Regardless, Orphelius is going taking the right direction. That is definitely the way to go. Go over to the eastern side of the map. Go where Google Frog has not set up. Don't try to contest it yet, because at this point, Google Frog does have a slight army advantage. Definitely a slight economy advantage. And a slight scythe advantage. They definitely have more scythes. As Orphelius has built none. But Orphelius does have a position they can come in with here. I mean, nine glaives. With the right positioning, with the right right approach vector, they might be able to get some damage in. I don't see them getting into these hammers, though. But they can at least make sure the hammers don't go any further forward and get a little bit of vision as well, just so they know what Google Frog's up to. Problem, of course, is the hammers are getting rid of the the pickets no problem, and Orphelius doesn't really have much of an answer. While at the same time, Google Frog just getting free scouting. They just know exactly what Orphelius is up to. And that is clever. Like, put a scythe in the way, get that set up, and that should work. While at the same time, Orphelius basically losing everything to a Napoleonic-style push from these glaives. And that is it. Orphelius deciding, well, I've lost my commander, lost my glaive army, not much I can do. Throws in the towel. That is game. Google Frog having a solid advantage from the word go. And only making five-minute game. That was... That was not what I expected. Really just came down to the fact that Orphelius did not have the early worker, didn't have the expansion from there, didn't get any major army set up, and as a result, wasn't really able to build up. While at the same time, Google Frog able to get that money, able to get that army, able to get the center, and taking the game. Yeah, that is... Well, that's that. That's the first match round two. Should have another match in a sec, because, I mean, there's plenty that are there. Ain't over yet. Round is still young. Still a lot of room here, but it's just a question of what what are we looking next? Because next match... I mean, who's available here? I think... Hmm. I'm kind of curious about what's going on between... Oh, I can see where I have already done their match, apparently. Or haven't started. So, let's go with... Let's go with Top Gak and 400. Curious what they are up to. Because, I mean, what are they up to? Who knows? We will. Very shortly. Just a matter of what... So, again, Cloaky on both sides, although a much... Much stronger for 400 right off the bat. Not managing to do a whole lot with that, but still managing to get a bit of pressure. At the very least, forcing Topcac to build their army. Topcac has managed to get enough of an economy, and the map is pretty evenly split, so at this point, Topcac able to get quite a bit of damage in, but no one managing to get any real advantage. So, unfortunately, there is not a whole lot going on here that Topcac is able to take advantage of, or 400. Both players 
have solidly lost their armies on multiple occasions thus far this game. But Tomcat actually losing the Northeast should be able to maintain that quickly, or get back to that quickly enough, but the question is whether or not they're going to be able to make use of the Ravens to do so. And it looks like they don't even care to do so. They just want to take the center. Or hold the center, rather. They already have the center. It's just a matter of whether or not they can hold it and push forward from there. Because that is a big advantage to have the center on this map. If you have that, that's a staging area. You can use that to continue pushing forward. You can use that essentially as a defensive position. There are no defenses there that they could be placed. No problem. It's definitely not a problem to work with. But at the same time, 400 going for a nice little sneaky gunship plant, which will be the death of their commander now that it's been scouted. But hey, it's not even too late. The commander doesn't even go down. Ooh, very slight miscalculation. I mean, the Swifts will be able to finish it off, but it's still... Actually, will it be able to finish it off? Hard to tell. It looks like just the ablative armor. The fact that it had just that little bit more HP. And also that little bit extra healing. I mean, it's still it's still dead. It took far longer to do, though. And at the same time, the Locust coming into the main base, getting rid of the air plant, possibly getting rid of the Cloakybot factory as well, and I, mean, the, I like the fact that they're that the Reaver is up. It's a good choice, but it's not going to be enough. The Cloakbot Factory will go down if the Locusts choose to make it so. I mean, valiant effort on the part of I mean, one Reaver and all of the Ravens, but now that it's dead, nothing stops the Cloakbot Factory from dying. Nothing stops Topcat from losing all production, while at the same time pushing forward on the side, and that is Topcat throwing in the towel. So very easily jumping in here, and then the towel is thrown. 400 taking it. So hey, 400 does manage to win a match. Not all losses for 400, so one and one, good showing from them. That's for sure. So at this point, it looks like we have a couple of round two matches done. Ikins has beaten Nemor. Guyop had done from not sure how that's going yet. Google Frog beat Orphelius. No, sorry. Yeah, Google Frog beat Orphelius handily. What am I saying? What am I saying sorry for? That was decisive victory. We saw that. And now, of course, we see that 400 has managed to take a game off top CAC. So at this point, we are going to be in a bit of a bit of an odd situation. I'm not quite sure who is most relevant now because I thought, oh, hey, top CAC 400, that's pretty even match. But at this point, it's actually kind of hard to say. Hmm. I think we'll check out Hokumoko and Poketrool. We haven't seen Poketrool yet. So I'm curious what they are up to. I like That is a brand new player. That is someone I've never seen in this game before. So I want to see what they're doing. I want to see if they have everything, anything up their sleeve. And I apparently am supposed to want to see Skazi, but that's not really who we're watching right now. So anyway, Pokedrill starting out with the Cloakbot Factory, Well, again, Hokumoko and Cloakbot, this is... forget what I said about rovers, apparently. Rovers are clearly not the meta for this map. Anyway, Pokedrill with a much more defensive opening. Not surprising, considering they are a newer player. But it's still working out pretty well. They managed to hold this long enough and managed to not lose too much from the economy. They could get the reclaim in and use that to take the game. Or at least take more of the map, but at this point, Hokumoko does have a very solid advantage on the map of Pokedrill. Relying entirely on static defenses to keep themselves in the game. Static defenses and, well, I would say sides, but they just lost both their commander and a factory. So they haven't really got much, all things considered. And Pokedrill should be losing his Hokumoko coming in here. While Pokedrill is getting a bit of damage in from the sides, Hokumoko has way too much in the main base. Way too much of an economy to make, to make that work. And Pokedrill, it's just a matter of time as they lose their base. Right as we come in here, the towel is thrown. Really just a highlights reel of all the matches coming in as, like, come in? GG. I come in the next one? GG. I think we're just going to take a break until round three starts, because it's pretty clear that this round, a lot of the interesting matches have already happened. And the ones that haven't, well, I mean, ten minutes is still a reasonably long match in this game. So, just wait on round three, and until then, stay tuned.